This is the seventh weekly update of the T2 Tile project. Let's get into it. The goal from last week, we had two possibilities. One was to actually build a new, a new board that has a light sensor on it and so forth. That was contingent on the board actually getting in from the uh, fab house. It did not, so that didn't happen. Uh, although we did finally, just as of yesterday, manage to get a tracking number and it's supposed to arrive by tomorrow. Now, I am not gonna put myself on the hook for assembling one of these boards for next week because I'm going to be traveling some for the holidays uh, but I have other stuff to focus on that'll be easier to do uh, when I'm away from all the hardware stuff uh, um, so that will have to wait a couple of weeks the other thing I was supposed to do was to get the uh, Ubuntu packaging back in my brain I haven't released Ubuntu packages since 2000 summer 2017 uh, I did a little bit of that but I didn't actually get to go but our one and only goal my one and only goal our one and only goal for next week is to actually get Ulam 4 with MFM that has the brick wall geometry for the T2 plus the first version of splat out in Ubuntu packages which means it will hit master in the repos and so forth for other possible purposes so mm, that's what we're shooting for Today, um, we've got a little bit of news. Uh, I wanted to have a few comments following up on a really good discussion uh, about fork bombs and incumbency that was on the YouTube channel. Uh, and uh, if I didn't get to your comment, I apologize for it. I, I, I pick a few. Sometimes I answer in the comments. Sometimes I answer here. Sometimes both. And then actually, I want to spend most of the time, it'll probably be eight or ten minutes, talking about the actual architecture of the T2 specifically. And uh, um, usually I'm afraid to talk about this stuff because I fear people are going to get bored. But on the other hand, you know, when I, as a programmer, want to hear someone here talking about a computational model, I actually want the details. I want to know what really is going to happen and how it all actually works. So I can start thinking about, ooh, that sounds like that would be fun to play with. That sounds like that's a trap and so forth. So I'm going to go through it uh, at a pretty detailed level, try to get all the sort of the actual, the way it works from the hardware point of view, a little bit about the way it works from the software point of view. That's today. Uh, um, now, one of the things that happened that I wanted just to show you, because I thought it was kind of cool, is I was working through the Ubuntu uh, packaging stuff, and there, there's a bunch of changes that need to happen uh, on the MFM command line and the Ulam command line uh, because of changes internally between uh, division of labor for various purposes. I'll talk about it another time. But one of the things I did was I got the CPP, the C++ demos, working again uh, that had been kind of broken for a while. And so this uh, will, this works on this actually hasn't been pushed yet, but this will work as of next week, put it that way. Uh, um, so you run with the command line argument CPP demos, and you get this, you know, completely packed full uh, uh, um, a palette of elements uh, combined in, uh, all kinds of various stuff. I just want to show you the one that uh, you may folks may have seen because there actually is a separate uh, video for it. This is Trent Small's procedural city generation implemented in the movable feast in C++. So you start with a sidewalk and the sidewalks make streets and they pop intersections and the intersections intersect with each other and where they mismatch it makes little parks and so on. Uh, uh, eventually this thing starts putting out little buildings and the buildings send out cars that wrap themselves around and it ends up looking to me like, you know, the uh, looking down uh, from a helicopter or a drone shot uh, of one of those cartoons when I was a kid. I don't remember what was it, Dick Tracy, Batman, something like that. Anyway, uh, um, getting all of the information that these uh, atoms use to communicate with each other packed into individual atoms is actually quite a trick. Trent was one of the original authors of the Moolable Feast Machine Simulator, so if anyone's going to be able to know how to do it, he is. Uh, there we go. And then uh, the, eventually the buildings start to pop up and so on. I'm not going to let this run because it's going to take a lot of time, but uh, it's pretty fun to play with. There's a bunch of other stuff that maybe will come back around because a lot of this uh, in the CPP demos, uh, these various things, are more of the kind of basic bottom-up dynamics, the sort of design patterns for robust first computing that we should be familiar with on the one hand and have names for on the other hand so that we can talk about them back and forth to each other. Anyway, okay, uh, so that I just wanted to show you a little bit. 
All right, uh, uh, we've got, uh, let's push on. So we, we've got news. Part of my excuse for why uh, I don't have the packages out, and it really is an excuse, uh, um, is that we got a, a pull request from Spencer Harmon uh, with a bunch of fixes and improvements for Splat. And that's like great. <laughs> it's like, you know, thank you, uh, um, you know, to improve the, the Perl packaging layout, to make it more official, and, and to make it work on his system, and so on and so forth. It's a great thoughtful commit uh it just came in yesterday or the day before i don't know uh so i haven't really gotten to evaluate it but i want to figure out how to get it into before the uh, uh ulam 4 goes out next week uh you know be warned spencer in particular uh that i've been kind of bad about actually trying to place the files out into the file system like they're supposed to go and pretty much everything goes into user lib ulam and then directories underneath that so my inclination will be to put the demo uh source codes there uh, as well uh but we'll see uh, i haven't really had a chance to look at it but again we're seven weeks into you know i finally tentatively asked the universe you know can you help me do this and 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 help is coming back and it just really makes me feel great so thank you so much in the same vein andrew walpole who's doing all the screen stuff now has uh, uh a mfm rocks store at mfmrocks.storeindy.com i'll put the link in the uh uh, description below uh, and you can buy carpe event window uh t-shirts I've, I've ordered two i haven't gotten them yet uh, uh but again <laughs> you know this is totally great uh, um so uh, i feel very very jolly uh, and you know the only thing that would make it even better is if i had a little bit more progress so let's push on um all right yes um there are uh, there was a tremendous amount of uh, good thinkings and, and discussion and back and forth on the YouTube comments about fork bombs and incumbency and so forth. And uh, I, you know, I, I, if I don't didn't get your comment up, I apologize. But you know, I just sort of pick a few. I responded to some down there. Uh, um, you know, Andrew Walpole, uh, uh, Mr. Everywhere, uh, says, you know, how about crypto? Uh, uh, it's sort of a standard approach. Uh, oh, hi, uh, says, you know, how are we going to avoid boot bootlegging if this thing is really going to be indefinitely scalable? I know everybody says infinitely, but I think infinite, I don't believe in infinity. Infinity is brain damage. So I say indefinitely to try to drive home that, you know, is it this big? Well, we could add more. You can't say it's definitely only this big because we could always add more. So it's indefinitely scalable uh, uh, just to avoid the word infinity because that's one of my trigger words. If it's supposed to be indefinitely scalable, it's hard to imagine how someone might not make their own boot like, yeah, absolutely. How are we going to deal with that? Uh, I guess it's Thunder Chief also talking about uh, the distinction between creation and destruction. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, and incumbency is this idea of a resource. Yeah, and that's actually really true. Uh, um, all of this, one of the things that we take for granted when we're looking at uh, computational systems is, you know, when you're an actual living system, you have to put food on the table. You actually have to go out and find the energy to keep yourself running. Whereas in uh, computational systems, in, in conventional manufactured computational systems, you just plug the sucker into the wall and the program doesn't have to deal with it at all. The entire system has paid the energy costs. Now that's becoming less and less true as things are more and more battery powered and we're dealing with uh, CPUs that will slow themselves down to save energy and turn the various regions off and spin down the disk and so forth. And gradually it becomes more like, well, depending on exactly what you're doing, w am I willing to run that program? Because that would cause me to speed up the CPU and I don't know if my battery could take it. In the end, there is a link between the real resource is, once you have a computational system, the real resource is, is energy of some kind to keep it running. Uh, and when we say we're going to do something like incumbency, is it how long you've been in a site? Is it how long the atom has been alive? What exactly does incumbency mean? That's what Thunder Chief was getting at. Uh, um, and yeah, these are all good questions. And somehow in the end, I would like to try to fold it all back toward the literally physical actual energy. When you, when you think something was good, you 
you, know, you plug it in, you know, and, and the energy will spread and that will ultimately be the resource that we're going to use somehow as best we can, if we can figure out how to starve things like fork bombs, because they're not making the owner of the hardware happy. So the owner is not going to give more power. Now, the problem of course, is how we can avoid having the awful fork bombs take the good guys down with it that's the whole game of civilization and it's exactly what's going to be going on inside an indefinitely scale computer just like it happens in the real world uh, um, i'm going to circle back around to crypto and stuff in a second but i just wanted to get on to the sort of physicality of energy and incumbency and to thank everybody for having these great comments uh, about the fork bombs on the discussion all right so let's talk about the t2 architecture for real I spent way too much time making this diagram, so we're going to take a good look at it. Uh, um, uh, all right, so let's just go through it all the way around, starting with, so here's one thing, um, bespoke physics. This is the idea that just like you talk about virtual machines, is a virtual machine a real machine or not a real machine? I mean, to a computer scientist, you say, well, who cares? Because it acts like a, a real machine in the sense that it's got an interface. If you do this, that happens. If you do this, that happens and so forth. So who cares whether it's physical machine or some other machine that was implemented in software, which was implemented in software, which is implemented in physical machine? Who cares? Bespoke physics is the same idea. When we're doing indefinitely scalable computation, we're making it out of tiles because we have to be able to make it as big as we possibly want. We have to be able to add to it while it's running. Uh, um, and in the end, physical space, the fact that this tile is east of this tile and this tile is northwest of that tile, is going to be reflected in the computational structures inside it. And that's very different than the way we think about traditional computation. But we can only think about traditional computation that way because we have random access memory, which puts everything right next to everything, which of course is the security disaster that we're living with, and of course is only finitely scalable. So what we are doing, I suggest, when we're writing our Ulam programs, when we're writing our SPLAT programs, we are creating a new set of laws of physics. And the, then the computations, the atoms running around on the sites and the fork bombs and whatever else, if we made fork bombs, we get fork bombs. It's up to us. Uh, all of that stuff is the, uh, you know, the, uh, the chemistry and the biology and, you know, one day the psychology and sociology and ecology of living computation built on these kinds of large scale, um, indefinitely scalable uh, fabric. Calling it uh, bespoke physics is meant to do several things. Number one, it's meant to suggest that the rules are fairly simple and finite and hopefully easy to explain. Uh, um, the Many of the rules of physics are, are extremely simple, whereas many of the rules defining how uh, instruction set architecture works. This is a comment that I made in a paper called Bespoke Physics for Living Computation that points out, you know, the Intel uh, instruction set architecture uh, specification is like 5,000 pages, 7,000 pages. It's crazy. Uh, the laws of physics, you know, F equals MA and all that kind of stuff. By contrast, much smaller. So when we write our Ulam pro program, when we write our SPLAT program, it's supposed to be like physics in the sense that ideally it prevents it presents a very generalizable, useful interface that most of the value that get out of it is not really the specific value of oxygen versus nitrogen versus carbon, but the fact that you can put them together in large numbers in so many different ways to do different things. The chemistry is emergent, and that's what we want as well. The other thing that we want to use to get out of the physics definition is the idea that it's rigid. The laws of physics don't change. And ideally, in a, in a tiled system, the code, the transition functions would be burned into ROM. They would be burned into custom logic and unchangeable. Once we knew that if you had this table of elements, you could do all kinds of wonderful things, the smart thing to do would be to get the programmability at the level of laws of physics out so that the laws of physics could no longer change. 
We're not anywhere near that, so we put the laws of physics into flash memory that can be written, and then we have to worry about, well, what if someone comes along and changes the laws of physics, uh, uh, the bespoke laws of physics out from underneath us, and that's the security risk and the crypto risk and so forth. So here's a picture of our tile, uh, a logical scheme. The tile is a Linux host uh, that runs the uh, hardware to perform the communication to the neighbors, the packets, uh, a packet protocol. It also provides uh, crypto checking when you build a, when you compile a, an MFZ file, you need to have a handle. The handle corresponds to a private key. The private key signs the MFZ file. We're going to do the same thing there so that T2 tiles out of the box, they're only going to run MFZ files that have been signed by somebody that is on the list of public keys that we install by hand when we configure the tile. Is that absolutely safe? Of course not. It has all of the typical problems of crypto and expired keys and uh, uh, pro stolen private keys and so forth. All of the same problems. But we're only using it because we are not smart enough yet to make the laws of physics read only. So we use traditional defense with all of its problems to make the updating, the changing the laws of physics, the performing of magic when the laws of physics are violated, existing laws change for crypto. The, uh, the, the T2 tile is going to handle that. It's also going to, uh, you know, migrate uh, MFC files from tile to tile automatically so that the we can inject a properly signed new MFC file into one tile and it will gradually infect the entire uh, connected grid. Uh, um, that will be a, a major milestone when we can actually see that happening on T2 hardware. That'll be great. All right. But one tile doesn't really mean very much. What we actually need is a whole grid of these things. We want to go on and on and on. This is the actual what I'm planning on doing. Uh, this, this may change, um, but the idea is to do 133 tiles plus a bunch more for spares and replacements. That's why I say 150 as a sort of target. Would it be cooler to do 266? Yeah, sure, you bet. <laughs> it's not cheap we have to figure out how to do it. 133 tiles. Why 133 tiles? Because that's 7 times 19. Why 7 times 19? Uh, because of this idea of a power zone. You, you take one tile in the middle, you put six tiles around it, and you put another layer of tiles around that, and that gives you 19 tiles, which is kind of shaped like a brick. It's got a little pointy ends, but in fact, you can now take one of those 19 tile zones and you can tile it with more copies of itself, which is what's happening up here. So this is seven 19 tile zones. These zones are not just administrative, they actually matter because you see these green connectors between tiles are sharing data and also sharing power. These uh, beige interconnects, which we use at the edge of a zone, share data but do not share power. So we can only support so much power getting shared through the physical pieces of copper that we're connecting these guys together with, and we have to engineer the system to handle it. And 19 tiles ought to be uh, pretty comfortable for the way I've specified it. Here, in fact, are the actual pin values. Every one of these little, uh, um, uh, here's one, uh, every one of these, uh, this is an intertile connector that's two 14 pins, 14 pins to 14 pins, and a little handle to stick it on the top. Uh, and this is the actual pin assignment. There's uh, each tile can ask the other one, can I have a lock? Meaning, is it okay if I do an event near the edge and then I will tell you what the result was, so don't you do an event near the edge? Uh, this one, the uh, corresponding grant is down here going in the other direction, uh, and they both have it. So in fact, they can race with each other, both saying, I want the lock, and they can get into a case where they both think they got it, 
and and they have to negotiate that. There's code already written in the Linux kernel module to handle that racing as best as we can. We'll talk about that another day. Uh, uh, in addition to, so there's two lines for lock request and lock grant going out, two lines for lock request and grant coming back the other way, plus two more lines in each direction for saying, I have the next data bit of the next packet going from me to you. Take it when you're ready. Uh, I am ready. Here's the value. Other guy says, I am ready here's the value and so on and the the bi-directional things are interlocked so when i go up that means uh, my value is ready but he can release his and then when he goes up his value is ready and i can update mine and they go back and forth so we're constantly sending bits in both directions uh, on each of these six-way intertile connectors and there's some some pretty nifty stuff about that as well so that's four lines four lines is eight lines plus power and ground, each of them gets three lines, uh, although that's not quite true. In the interzone connectors, these three lines that connect power are broken so that power doesn't go through, but otherwise ground does. Okay, so we're gonna be able to use kind of a typical wall ward power supply that's uh, sold by the gazillions these days to power LED strips. Uh, uh, which is also kind of the reason that we're settling on 12 volt power. We're going to be able to plug one of these things into the middle of each power zone and, and then figure out whether we're going to get enough power out of the mains. Uh, uh, I do imagine that if we actually really scaled this thing out, we might actually end up having to, you know, run power zones off of car batteries or something on tables uh, uh, and only run it in sort of brief spurts until we can trickle charge everything back up. But that's for a way another day. Uh, so that's the idea. So we have a grid. Uh, the grid can, in principle can consist of however many uh, power, uh, power zones that we can afford. In this case, we're going for seven. Uh, um, and each of them connects together and then the down to the tiles. Uh, in addition to doing all of the actual hardware management, we're going to run a version of MFMS simulator on each tile, except it's going to be called MFMT2. Uh, um, and it's going to know how to interface with the hot uh, hardware drivers, the packet formats and so forth. So that instead of simulating another tile, there actually will be another tile and we'll talk to it, but otherwise the code will run mostly the same. That's what we're hoping. Um, so we'll get all of the, the storage for all the individual sites. This is the other point I wanted to make before we get start finishing up here is so each tile has an array, a two dimensional array of sites. That's the important thing to keep in mind. We think in terms of atoms, which are instances of elements, but what's physical is a site. And uh, so here's a, re a representation of a site. It, it's got room to store one atom. It's got called the, the active atom. This is the one that actually gets events, but there is more information there. There's also a U32, a, a regular 32 bit integer that holds a color, which which determines what is painted on the screen. And there's also another atom called the passive atom that can be read and written just as additional storage by the active atom, but it never gets events. You could make a copy of yourself. You could mark it for your favorite thing. You could draw pheromone trails on the passive atoms. The only restriction is you can only read and write the atom that's directly underneath you. You cannot look at the rest of the event windows uh, passive atoms. You have to be there. And then there are our sensors so that we can have actually touch sensors and the fact that there was a drag going by and so forth. And perhaps in the future, light sensors from the thing being within wet range by and so forth. Uh, all of that is expressed in terms of these transition rules that say if you see this event window replace it with this event window that determines the chemistry the biology the zygology and everything else of larger scale systems uh, um We've got uh, ULAM code, which we can use to write these transitions. We could write splat code, which compiles to ULAM code to write other transitions. Important point is all of that is laws of physics. That cannot change, again, modulo traditional security failures, which can certainly happen in our research tiles that have rewritable laws of physics. But all of that is at a very different level of stiffness and rigidity than the atoms, the instances of dreg and seed and so forth that are running around just as, content, as contents of uh, the active site, the active atom in sites.
Okay, so there's the explicit distinction that traditional computing tries to avoid by making everything universal. Numbers is just programs. Program is just numbers uh, in the traditional von Neumann machine approach. Uh, we're pulling it apart in two very separate stages. You, you write uh, laws of physics. We protect that as best we can with what we'd like to protect it with, you know, inability to do anything else. We actually got to protect it with crypto and so forth. And then the program that is running on the combination, the grid full of sites. Now, here's more details. Each of the atoms, uh, this is called the P3 atom. We did have uh, P1 atoms and P2 atoms. P2 didn't know if it really got out too much, but this is the P3 atom. Each atom is 96 bits long. And once you actually start programming with it, then you start thinking, wow, how the heck did Trent Small do all that stuff in his procedural generation of the city with only 96 bits to work with? But wait, it's worse than that. Because of those 96 bits, 16 bits represent the type of the atom. When we say element seed here in some splat code or element drag down here in some ULAM code, that ends up corresponding to a type number of which there are 65,000, 16 bits worth. Um, and that's how we get from reading the atom to the associated transition rule. We have a table that maps from atomic type to a pointer to the corresponding function to do the job. That's how it works. Now, what would happen if one of these atomic type bits got corrupted? You know, X-ray, cosmic ray, something like that comes in. The problem with the atomic type is it's a very high leverage set of bits because there's nothing that the Ulam programmer or the Splat programmer could do to defend against a flaw, a failure of the uh, atomic type. So we have nine bits that are dedicated for error correcting code. This is not error correcting code for the entire 96 bits. This is nine bits just for the atomic type. That leaves 71 bits left over that we can actually program with. It takes some getting used to, it absolutely does. But from there we go up, we put 41, uh, we put sites together, each tile has a rectangular array, they tile together and we have events that happen on them and so on. I'm imagining, I'm, I'm saying second, first quarter 2019, we're actually going to have these tiles in hand. I really want that to be true. Exactly how many sites we put on each tile remains to be seen. 64 by 32, 2000 sites per tile. Who knows? It might work. That might be too slow. This whole thing is going to be super, super, super slow. If you think your simulator is running too slow because it's doing only 20 air or something like that, 20 average event rate, sites per average events per site per second, I am going to be happy if a T2 grid does one air, one event per site per second on average across an arbitrarily large grid. As far as I'm concerned, one air is the line in the sand. That's what we will establish. And then we'll say, hey, you know how to design hardware better than this. You know how to do optimize stuff better than this. Beat it. If we can get two air, if we can get five air, that's great. One air will do what we need it to do, which is say, this is now possible. You can create an indefinitely scalable computer from here to the horizon that does one event per site per second for as many sites as you want. All right. So that's it. Uh, the next episode will be out one week from today. <sighs> uh, happy Friendsgiving Day if you're in the United States. And hope you have a good week in any case, no matter where you are. Thanks so much for watching.